Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, the SNP Government ordered an urgent review on how double rapist Isla Bryson, formerly Adam Graham, was allowed into a woman's prison. The review was due to be delivered to prison chiefs on Friday, but we have heard nothing further about it. The case of this double rapist has been a huge scandal, but the public are in the dark about exactly what happened and who was involved. So will the First Minister publish the urgent review in full today? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, before I turn to answer Douglas Ross's question, can I take the opportunity to express my sympathy with the people of Turkey and Syria following the devastating earthquake earlier this week? The suffering and loss of life will be felt for generations. We are committed to doing all we can to help. Members of our emergency services have already been deployed to help the search and rescue operation on the ground. Yesterday we confirmed a £500,000 contribution to the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal. I know that all parties will help promote that appeal following First Minister's questions and anybody who wishes and is able to do so uh, can do so at www.dec.org.uk. Second officer, turning to the question uh, on the review uh, that has been referred to, the SPS provided uh, a final report to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice on the 8th of February. Uh, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service met the Justice Secretary in the course of a regular uh, meeting schedule yesterday to discuss that. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has already confirmed uh, he will update the Criminal Justice Committee uh, this week and both the Cabinet Secretary and the SPS Chief Executive are due to attend the Justice Committee later in February where of course members of this Parliament will be able to ask questions. So there will be full transparency about the findings of that review as is right and proper. Douglas Ross. Could I associate myself with the remarks of the First Minister, and she's correct, all party leaders and MSPs uh, will join in solidarity after FMQs to support the DEC Scotland uh, appeal, and I welcome the uh, funding provided by the Scottish Government and I believe the significant match funding by the UK Government on all donations uh, received to help and support those who have been terribly affected uh, in Turkey uh, and Syria. So again, sorry, we're in this situation. I asked the First Minister a very direct question and I don't get an answer. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice had this report yesterday. The First Minister spoke about uh, further discussions with the Justice Committee but failed to commit to publishing the report in full. Will she now do that? Will the First Minister confirm that her government will publish the report in full? It's on the Justice Secretary's desk. I assume she has seen it. The public deserve to see it. Because there are still so many unanswered questions. At the last count, the First Minister had refused 12 times to say if Isla Bryson is a man or a woman. And it's important because that affects how public bodies treat these criminals when they are released from jail. The First Minister says she doesn't have enough information to decide if this double rapist is a man. He's a rapist. He has a penis. What further information can the First Minister possibly need? So can I ask her, when this monster comes out of jail, Will Nicola Sturgeon, I'm sorry, if SNP members are grumbling at me calling a double rapist a monster, you should look at yourselves. Because I'm asking, when he comes out of jail, will Nicola Sturgeon and her government consider him a man or a woman? First Minister. Uh, firstly, on the uh, report, Presiding Officer, I, I really do think Douglas Ross is clutching at straws in his follow-up uh, question. I, I made very clear the findings, the findings of the report will be published. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirmed, I believe he confirmed in this chamber, that he will update the Criminal Justice Committee this week. Uh, Parliament rises today, uh, of course, for uh, this week, and both the Cabinet Secretary and the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, Theresa Medhurst, uh, will actually attend the Justice Committee on the 22nd of February, following uh, the week's uh, recess of Parliament, and members of that committee uh, will be able to ask questions 
about that review. So I'm not sure how anybody can suggest that there is not going to be full transparency around that review. But uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to set that out again uh, for Mr Ross. Um, on the uh, subsequent part of his question, uh, the individual we're talking about here uh, identifies uh, as a woman. Uh, however, it is really important, I think, to very calmly uh, set out that any rights associated uh, with that uh, are not a result of any legislation passed by this Parliament uh, and indeed wouldn't uh, be the result of that legislation even if it were in force. It's a result of the Equality Act passed uh, by the UK Parliament, reserved to the UK Parliament in 2004, uh, which is effectively and always has effectively been based on self-identification. Uh, however, uh, what it doesn't do is give any individual an automatic right uh, to be treated in a certain way in the prison estate. And actually, this case demonstrates uh, that because the individual is in a male yeah. prison. What is relevant here and why I have focused on this is the crime and the nature of the risk posed. In this case, the individual is a double rapist, and in terms of decisions about how they are dealt with in the prison estate, that is the relevant factor. Uh, and finally, presiding officer, in any group, uh, individuals, small minority of individuals, uh, will commit crimes. In no other circumstances do we accept the stigmatisation and the denial of rights to the whole group, and we shouldn't do that here either. The first, so to go back to the first point about this report, the First Minister claims I'm clutching at straws on this. It seems that she's clutching onto this report because she's not willing to issue it in full today. The report findings, we are told, will be published at some point. Why not today? Why not publish the findings and the full report that your Justice Secretary has had for over 24 hours? And for the 13th time now, Nicola Sturgeon has been unable to say if Isla Bryson is a man or a woman and she says it doesn't matter because it's how they're dealt with on the prison estate but my question was very specifically about how they're dealt with when they leave prison and the First Minister has tied herself up in knots over this issue unable to answer that basic question because she can't admit the truth her government is going to consider this double rapist a woman. Nicola Sturgeon has brought in a policy that states everybody who claims to be a woman must be considered a woman, even if they're a dishonest sex offender with a history of violence. So Isla Bryson will be considered a woman by this government, and that's why the First Minister is refusing to answer questions about this double rapist. So let me ask her about another offender, serving time right now. Not a rapist, but a dangerous criminal with a history of brutal violence. Tiffany Scott, formerly known as Andrew Burns, claims to be a woman. Does the First Minister believe this criminal is a woman? First Minister. I think Douglas Ross is demonstrating here a lack of understanding in the law. Uh, any rights... Any rights uh, that any individual identifying as a woman uh, have uh, flow not from any decisions of this government or any decisions of this parliament. They flow uh, from the protected characteristic provisions in the 2004 Equality Act, which is UK-wide legislation and is and has always been uh, based on self-identification. A gender recognition certificate, and of course the law passed by this parliament is not yet in force, but a gender recognition certificate uh, simply enables somebody to change their birth certificate. It does not give trans people any additional rights, um, and that is important. Uh, and in terms of how individuals are treated uh, within the prison service, uh, as I have said, that is based on the nature of the crime and the nature of the risk posed. And both of the cases, of course, that Douglas Ross has cited today demonstrate that in terms uh, of the prisons uh, that these individuals are in. Um, and in terms of uh, how prisoners are treated when they leave prison, uh, for sex offenders, of course, there are well-established uh, procedures, including the MAPA procedures. And again, they are based on an assessment of the nature 
of risk. So these are important issues. Uh, they are sensitive issues, not least for uh, the trans community. As I said last week, and I've said before, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom only want to go on with living their lives and never commit any offences of any nature. But I don't think Douglas Ross uh, does any service to anybody in the way that he approaches this. Uh, I'm struck uh, by something his predecessor, a Scottish uh, Conservative uh, leader, Ruth Davidson, uh, has said. Trying to do gotcha questions about who is a woman, who is a man, I'm not sure helps, particularly for people in the trans community who are looking at the way this is reported. Uh, so perhaps Douglas Ross uh, could take some guidance from his predecessor uh, on uh, this matter, and that might uh, serve this whole debate better than the way he is doing yeah. right now. Okay. Thank you. This, this is not a, a gotcha question. It's a very basic. I'm sorry, there's dissent from the SNP. It's a very basic question. It's, it's not just me. It's journalists who are asking this repeatedly to the First Minister. And, and I wouldn't stand up here asking these questions if at any point in the 13 previous attempts I'd ever got a straight answer from Nicola Sturgeon. So maybe don't focus on the question. Focus on the deficiency of the answer. The fact that Nicola Sturgeon, now on two criminals who she said, uh, I've raised two different cases, they are. They're very different cases. But the similarity is the First Minister's point-blank refusal to give an answer. And I think she has to look at that. Uh, and the First Minister accused me of basic misunderstanding uh, of legislation. I'd have to say she's guilty of either basic or deliberate uh, misunderstanding of her own policy. Because it's quite clear Tiffany Scott, this dangerous criminal, is treated as a woman in a man's jail. We've spoken to a former prison officer who told us this. All officers dealing with this individual were ordered to refer to Tiffany Scott as she and threatened with disciplinary measures if we didn't. They said that Scott, and this is quoting them, has used gender recognition as a tool to create as much chaos as possible within the prison system. And they continued, this is a classic example of devious, dangerous individuals who are exploiting this ridiculous situation. The words of a retired prison officer who has dealt with this person. We also know that female prison officers have been ordered to carry out intimate strip searches of Tiffany Scott. Reports quote officers who say nothing else about Scott has changed physically and the officers say their rights have gone out of the window. So does the First Minister agree with me that this is completely unacceptable and will she intervene today to stop women prison officers being forced to strip search the likes of Tiffany Scott? First Minister. Let me take these issues in turn. Firstly, and uh, let me reiterate this, uh, the law that this parliament passed uh, before Christmas, backed by two thirds of MSPs uh, across this chamber, including members of Douglas Ross's uh, own party, is not yet in force. It wouldn't have the impact Douglas Ross says, even if it was in force, but it's not in force. Uh, so by definition, it can't have that impact. The policies of this government, the policies of this government on these issues uh, are guided by the Equality Act. I think I said earlier on 2004, of course, the Equality Act is 2010, but they are guided by the Equality Act, governed by the Equality Act, uh, which is a UK-wide piece of legislation. Um, and the rights uh, and protections that trans people have flow from that legislation, um, and that is important. Uh, to set out. Uh, those in the prison estate uh, are dealt with depending on the nature of the crime and the nature of the risk uh, posed. Um, and again, it's important, uh, I think, for reasons of public assurance uh, to underline that as well. And that is demonstrated uh, by the two cases that have been cited in the media in recent days and here again today. Uh, and when it comes to uh, searches in the prison estate, 
Uh, firstly, the Scottish Prison Service, uh, of course, has been dealing with transgender prisoners, although they are very, very small in number for many, many years now. They have been doing it uh, safely and effectively. Uh, they are experienced in managing uh, these situations. Uh, but, of course, it is also the case that the SPS have the ability uh, to use technology uh, to search individuals without the need for any physical search uh, to be conducted by officers. The SPS uh, has a trauma-informed approach uh, to the management of those in custody um, and an approach that supports uh, staff as well as inmates uh, in their care. Uh, so the SPS is experienced uh, in these matters. I trust uh, their handling of these matters and it's important that we continue to ensure uh, that they are handled appropriately. And that's what uh, the government, in association with the Scottish Prison Service, will continue to do. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, we will all be devastated by the scenes in Turkey and Syria with the uh, horrific earthquake and a death toll now sitting at. We will suspend business at this point. We will resume, and I call at question two, Anna Sarwar. President of Sabud, question disruption at any time, but to disrupt when we're talking about the lives lost in Turkey and Syria, I think is frankly disgusting. The, the death toll has now reached over 16,000, and like Douglas Ross and Nicholas Sturgeon, I send my uh, condolences to all those that have lost a loved one in Turkey and Syria. And I think of all those families living in Scotland that have a connection uh, with Turkey and Syria. And can I welcome the announcements made by both the Scottish and the UK governments uh, in terms of money and resources to support uh, the relief effort? Uh, and can I also appeal to people across the country? I know times are really difficult with family budgets, but anything you can give to support the DEC appeal will make a huge difference to families suffering in uh, Turkey and Syria. Officer, this SNP government is leaving councils the length and breadth of Scotland in a dire position. Despite what Nicola Sturgeon claims, independent analysis shows that the budgets councils have control over are being cut by £304 million in real terms. That means devastating consequences for vital services. So will the First Minister finally admit that she is cutting local government budgets? First Minister. This government is increasing uh, local government budgets. Uh, the resources available to local government uh, in terms of next year's budget, of course, if Parliament passes next year's budget, uh, the increase will be £570 million. Of course, inflation is sky high uh, right now. Uh, that is not uh, a result of policies of this government. And of course, that is affecting the budget of this government as well. Uh, so absolutely, it is the case that local government is struggling with these financial constraints, as all parts of the public sector, and indeed, as Anna Sarwar has just said, households 
households uh, are struggling as well. That is why it is important that we continue to support local government as much as we can. Uh, obviously, the budgetary process is still underway and will conclude uh, following the February recess of Parliament. And we will continue to discuss with COSLA ways that we can help them mitigate the difficult situa situation they find themselves in. Of course, last week I invited Anna Sarwar to point to other parts of the draft budget that he thought we could take resources from uh, if he wants us to give more money to local government. He may have sent those to my office. I don't know in which case uh, I will look at those, but I suspect he hasn't come up uh, with any uh, reasonable or realistic or credible proposals to do that. Anna Sarwar. First Minister knows we published a document showing £3 billion of waste under this SNP government. That would be a good place uh, to start. But the First Minister wants to deny reality. The Fraser of Allender, the IFS, SPICE, Scotland's councils, including our own, all saying there is a real terms cut to local government budgets, but a truth that this First Minister is not willing to accept. And there is no way for councils to balance the books without further destroying local services. All of Scotland's 32 councils are united in their opposition to this government's cuts. This is what a presentation to council leaders said last week. Cuts have already fallen disproportionately on council services, libraries, culture and leisure, sports facilities, youth work, waste, roads, parks. These are cuts that have already happened in previous years. And the presentation concludes that the government's plans are, and I quote, increasingly unrealistic, not sustainable, risks non-delivery of other statutory duties, and puts the financial viability of local government at risk. Councillors of every political party, including her own, are angry and warning her of the dire consequences. But Nicola Sturgeon is not listening. As usual, she is right and everyone else is wrong. Why can't the First Minister see the damage her decisions are making to our communities? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think Anna Sarwar demonstrated the lack of any credible proposals coming uh, from Labour in the first part of that question. Secondly, he mentioned uh, the IFS. Uh, it's important to underline that IFS analysis confirms uh, that council funding has increased since 2018-19. It's gone up uh, since, sorry, since 2013-14, it's gone up by £2.2 uh, billion. Pounds. That's 22.9% higher in cash uh, terms. Uh, but of course, it is the case that inflation is high. So when Anna Sarwar shouts at me uh, from a sedentary position, what about real terms? Uh, yes, inflation is high right now, and that is affecting all parts of the public sector. And of course, that is de designed, uh, down to decisions uh, and economic mismanagement of the Conservatives at Westminster. But we come back to... We come back to the central point, presiding officer. All of us can accept that these are really difficult times for local councils and we will continue to work with local councils to support them as much as we can. But the draft budget that is before Parliament right now has all of the resources at our disposal, including the revenue from asking those who earn the most to pay a bit more in tax. All of uh, that revenue is allocated within that draft budget. So anybody who says, and I understand why they would make this argument that we should give more money to local government, has a duty and a responsibility to point uh, in that draft budget to the lines where they think that money should come from. Is it the NHS? Is it the police budget? Uh, these are legitimate debates. Is it social security? These are legitimate debates. Uh, but if you want to be credible in these debates, you can't only argue one side of it. You have to do both of the bits. Uh, that's what governing is all about. Anna Sarwar. We can only have an honest debate if we get an honest answer from the First Minister. This is a real terms cut to local government budgets. And the First Minister is out of touch with reality. Let's look at what's on the table. Let's look at what's on the table and the options councils are being forced to consider. Aberdeen, outsourcing all social work and children's services. Falkirk, selling off over 100 council buildings, including swimming pools and theatres. Glasgow, slashing care placements for children, which officials warn will compromise children's safety and increase the risk of abuse and neglect. Enough is enough. Get off your backs and speak out against this First Minister. Because across the country, we are facing a future where children's music lessons are cut, libraries are closed, and where bins will only be collected once a month. And the blame for all of this lies with Nicola Sturgeon and her government. Because wherever you look, this government is losing its grip. People used to say the First Minister was competent. Now she is saying, now they're saying she's out of control. And that's just people in her own political party. After 15 years of this SNP government, local government in crisis, 
teachers on strike, the NHS on its knees, so will she finally admit that this is an SNP budget for cuts, for closures and for strikes? First Minister. Well, no matter how much Anna Sarwar raises his voice um, in shouts, it, it doesn't cover... It doesn't cover up the fact that he has not brought forward a single proposal within a budget that is fully allocated uh, for putting a single extra penny into local government budgets. Uh, that's why he shouts, because there is absolutely yep. zero absolutely. substance in anything he's saying. All sound and fury and no substance is a good summary of Anas Sarwar. But let me take, let me take some of the points. Uh, Anas Sarwar is talking about real terms. Uh, the £570 million uh, increase that I have spoken about, that is actually a real terms increase of £160.6 million, 1.3%. Secondly, in terms of uh, the proposals that councils are looking at, at this time every year, uh, councils look at a range of proposals. I've seen proposals from, I think, Glasgow City Council this morning, and the point is made. Uh, these are options that no decisions have been taken. I remember a few years ago claims at this time of year that there were going to be 15,000 job cuts across local government. Uh, since then, uh, jobs have actually increased by 19,000. Ah. So, yes, these are difficult times for local government, but if you want to propose more money for local government within a draft budget that is fully allocated, yeah. then to have any credibility, you also have to say where that resource should come from. Um, and in the absence of Anna Sarwar uh, being clear about that, I can only assume that he wants us to take money from the National Health Service yeah. uh, or from budgets and give it to local government eh, or social security perhaps it's the Scottish child payment so if Anna Sarwar wants to be taken seriously he really has to bring some substance to what is a very difficult debate and a very difficult situation for local councils across the country question number three Virgil Fraser thank you presiding officer to ask the first minister what assessment the Scottish government has made of the potential impact on the hospitality and tourism sectors of a ban on advertising alcohol products. First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, the consultation on alcohol advertising and promotion is ongoing. It's open until 9th of March, so let me be very clear, uh, no decisions have been taken on scope uh, or type of any restrictions that might be taken forward in future. The point of the consultation is to get a range of views on the most appropriate next steps in reducing alcohol-related harm which I hope we can all recognise is one of uh, the most pressing public health challenges that we face. Uh, considering restriction in promotion of alcohol is not unique to Scotland. For example, Ireland passed legislation to bring in a number of restrictions five years ago, restrictions that were focused on reducing the exposure of children to alcohol promotion, and I think that is uh, key, reducing the exposure of children. Uh, ministers have met with a range of stakeholders, including representatives from the alcohol and advertising industries, uh, during the consultation period to hear directly from them, and of course will take seriously and consider properly all representations made. Murdo Fraser. Can, can I thank the First Minister for her response? Mm. She will know that the whisky tourism sector is worth some £84 million annually to the Scottish economy and supports jobs in rural and remote communities where there are a few other opportunities. And yet uh, this sector, as its leaders have, have been uh, very clear about, is concerned at the threat from a ban on all alcohol advertising. Now, I would agree with the First Minister, we do need to look at sensible measures to tackle alcohol abuse. But does she agree with me that it would be absurd mm -hmm. if whisky distilleries which are so important to our economy, had to cover up all their signage, close their shops, stop promoting tours, and the likes of the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh, which is a tremendous tourism draw, had to rebrand itself and board up its windows, which is what people are concerned about. First Minister. Uh, yes. Yes, to be clear, Presiding Officer, I, I do agree with that, and I'll come back to that perhaps uh, in a moment. But firstly, the whisky tourism sector is extremely important uh, to Scotland's reputation as well as uh, to Scotland's economy. The Johnny Walker Experience uh, Centre here in Edinburgh is a prime example of that. So some of the suggestions we've heard in recent weeks, just let me uh, be clear uh, that the target would be painted signs on distilleries or visitor centres are not in our current thinking. Uh, and let me be very clear about that. There is also 
a world of difference. And uh, remember what I said uh, in my initial answer about exposure of children to alcohol advertising. There is a world of difference between a billboard uh, outside or in the vicinity of a school and, for example, a, a Johnny Walker baseball cap. Uh, so we've got to uh, look pragmatically and seriously at this. I'm glad Murdo Fraser recognised that we have a, an issue, a problem, a public health issue with alcohol misuse. So like countries such as Ireland have done, we need to look at promotion and advertising and how we sensibly restrict that to try to deal with that problem. But we need to do that uh, properly and pragmatically. And and I hope uh, this answer uh, will give some reassurance uh, to those in the whisky tourism sector about some of the uh, supposed things uh, that we've heard in recent days and weeks. Natalie Dawn. As there is still a live consultation on the restriction of alcohol advertising and as no final proposals have been lodged, would the First Minister agree with me that any potential harm is still hy hypothetical at this stage, whereas the real harms being experienced by hospitality and tourism sectors caused by Brexit are being felt right now and the Tories should be pushing their Westminster leaders to address this? First Minister. Natalie Dawn is, is so right uh, to talk. Well, the Conservatives don't like it. To talk about the difference between hypothetical harm, um, and I understand the concerns that have been expressed, and hopefully what I've said today will allay those concerns on the part uh, of the, the whisky tourism sector, for example. But there is very real harm being done today right now uh, by Brexit. The loss of free movement is causing harm, for example, uh, specifically to our hospitality and tourism sectors as well as to the wider economy. So we'll continue to listen uh, to the hospitality sector, the tourism sector, to the, the whisky tourism sector in particular in relation to this issue uh, and take on board uh, reasonable points that they make. If only the UK government would adopt yeah. uh, a similar posture yeah. when it came to these industries expressing concern about the very real impacts and the very real harm that Brexit is doing to them right now. Great point. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating East Lothian publican Patrick Kearney, who has recently stepped in to prevent two local pubs, the Preston Grange Gothenburg and Preston Pans, and the Tower Inn in Trenent from permanent closure? But does she also recognise that around Scotland, hundreds of pubs are likely to close their do doors for good uh, this winter? So to prevent last orders being called across Scotland's hospitality sector, will she remove pubs and restaurants and cafes from the chaotic DRS scheme, replicate the UK Government's 75% rates relief for hospitality businesses? and halt the alcohol and advertising and sponsorship review, which will inevitably put further pressure on Scotland's hard-pressed publicans. First Minister. Well, firstly, let me uh, echo the congratulations extended uh, by the member in his uh, question. Of course, pubs, like many uh, businesses, are struggling uh, with high inflation right now, at high energy costs in particular. We'll come on to a question shortly about DRS. Uh, so I'll save uh, my uh, substantial comments on that until that uh, question. Of course, uh, businesses uh, such as these will also benefit from this government's approach uh, to business rates. We have the most competitive business rates uh, regime, uh, including release uh, for businesses uh, to business rates of, of any country in the UK. So we'll continue to do everything we can to support businesses in these very difficult times. Uh, and of course, much of these difficult times are down to the economic mismanagement of the Conservative government at Westminster. Question number four, Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that 600, 600 drinks producers are concerned about the impact on their businesses and the survival of them in relation to the deposit return scheme. First Minister. Well, we will continue to listen to and, where possible, address concerns that have been raised. Um, in direct response to industry feedback, of course, the Scottish Government has already worked with Circularity Scotland, uh, the scheme administrator, to reduce costs to producers. This includes a reduction in producer fees of up to 40% and a two-thirds reduction in day one payments for producers using UK-wide barcodes. Uh, we continue to work with industry to ensure that there are pragmatic approaches uh, to implementation, uh, and we will do so right up to the point of implementation. Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, many of these 600 businesses are in a state of fear and even despair. 
Some will close, some will fail, and others will no longer sell their own produce in their own country of Scotland. First Minister, unless halted now, this scheme, which most businesses believe to be fatally flawed, will damage the reputation of Scotland as a place to do business. Therefore, First Minister, will you instruct a pause of this disaster of a scheme before it becomes a catastrophe? And will you order a thorough and independent review of how better to achieve its aims and exclude glass from the scope as the top six nations in the world on glass recycling have done. First Minister. We will continue to listen to and engage with businesses. The steps we've already taken as I uh, set out already demonstrate uh, that and I think it is important to say that. Um, in fact, uh, Scotland Food and Drink recognised this approach when they said uh, in recent weeks these changes mean that some of our key respects have been accommodated, which is positive, and means our collective effort has materially improved the implications for many businesses. In terms of uh, glass, uh, there are 44 countries and territories operating deposit return schemes. Uh, only four of them uh, don't include uh, glass. Um, and of course, it is the case that uh, there are strong environmental reasons uh, for including uh, glass. But of course, uh, on all these issues, we will continue to listen. Uh, one of the issues I, I am particularly concerned to consider further, if there is yet more we can do to reduce any impact on small producers, because uh, I think some of the concerns that have been raised there um, are not unreasonable. So we will continue to take a responsible approach, listening uh, to the concerns of business and responding uh, responsibly in the face of them. Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, drinks producers have until the end of this month to sign up for the deposit return scheme. Those who do will be financially liable for any delays, having to fork out up to £1.5 million per month. Making matters worse, they are being asked to sign up with key information still missing. But if they don't sign up, they can't sell their products. One leading Scottish brewer described it as, and I quote, extortion tactics. Does the First Minister agree the deadline for such registration should be extended until the full operational, commercial and finan financial implications of the scheme are provided? First Minister. I'm struck by the fact that when we uh, did announce an extension to uh, the go live uh, date for this scheme uh, back in, I think, December 2021, giving industry additional time to prepare, I think that was criticised at the time by the, the Conservatives, amongst others, in this uh, chamber. Uh, the regulations require producers to register ahead of the launch. Registration is now open. Uh, but we continue to work, and this is important, with Circularity Scotland and with businesses as they finalise uh, their operational delivery plans. This is an industry-led scheme, and the industry needs to work with the scheme administrator on a joined-up approach to delivering it. We have already made changes. I've set these out, uh, and we will continue to engage with businesses on any further uh, changes that can sensibly be made to take account uh, of some of the issues they are raising. Question number five, Mercedes Vialba. To ask the First Minister, in light of reports of people being forced onto prepayment metres, what steps the Scottish Government is taking to support vulnerable people in Scotland with rising energy costs? First Minister. Well, first of all, uh, the Scottish Government opposes the forced installation of prepayment metres uh, because it's only uh, more likely to increase debt or leave people unable to heat their homes. Uh, we continue to call on the UK Government to provide the necessary additional support for those struggling with energy bills, but also doing everything we can uh, with the powers available to us. This includes doubling the fuel and security fund to £20 million and providing an additional £1.2 million to help advice services meet the increasing demand that they are dealing with. Uh, I chaired two energy summits uh, last year. As a result of these, uh, we continue to work with partners to see what more we can do uh, by working together uh, to support and protect Scottish consumers in these times. Mercedes Vialba. 
Oil and gas giants BP and Shell are reporting record profits on the sale of energy while millions are struggling to heat their homes. But the extortion doesn't stop there. I've received reports from Dundee Pensioners Forum that their elderly members are receiving alarming letters demanding payment from their energy suppliers. Payments to accounts that are not only not in arrears but are actually in significant credit. And when these vulnerable people are unable to pay, to pay what they do not even owe, they're being threatened with forced prepayment installation. So, Presiding Officer, while I appreciate that much of energy policy is reserved, the First Minister does meet regularly with the energy providers and she does have their ear. So will the First Minister condemn any use of such bullying and strong-arm tactics and will she commit to ending the granting of warrants by courts in Scotland for the forced installation of prepayment Meters. First Minister. I, I've, not, I've not seen the, the letters that the member refers to, uh, but of course I would condemn uh, any behaviour that seeks to, to bully uh, consumers or individuals in any way. Uh, two issues were raised in the course of that question, both important issues. Uh, firstly, taxation of oil and gas companies, um, and secondly, energy regulation. Both of these things are reserved to the UK Government. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we had powers uh, here in the Scottish Parliament, and perhaps the Member will support our calls for such powers in future. Um, as First Minister, I cannot instruct courts. Uh, I think every member understands that. Uh, but within the powers we have available to us, and on energy, uh, as the member recognises, these powers are very limited. Of course, this Parliament will and should, uh, and the Government will and should, look to see what more we can do to help. But here, as on so many other issues, if we didn't always have to look to the UK Government, and if we held these powers here in Absolutely. the Scottish Parliament, we'd be able to do much more than we are right now. Fiona Hislop. We also know from this Parliament's Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee's report into energy price rises that customers moving into properties with expensive prepayment meters also have to pay for the privilege of having them removed. As recommended in last summer's uh, committee report, can the First Minister confirm if her government has raised with the UK government the issue of a legal right under appropriate circumstances to have a prepayment meter removed free of charge? First Minister. Yeah, this is an important issue that, that Fiona Hislop also raises, and I absolutely agree that consumers should be entitled uh, to have a prepayment meter removed from their homes uh, and at no cost to them. Uh, the Energy Secretary wrote to the UK Government last autumn on a number of issues, including protections and flexibility for consumers on prepayment meters. And given recent developments surrounding prepayment meters, I can confirm that this is one of a number of issues that we will be raising urgently with both the UK Government and the regulator. Question number six, Mark Ruskell. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether oil and gas companies are investing enough of their profits to support a just transition in Scotland. First Minister. I certainly think uh, that more could be done. The energy profit levies investment allowance doesn't do enough to future-proof energy supplies and promote green energy. Energy companies should reinvest. Uh, their profits right now, their very significant profits in industries of the future. The Draft Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan, uh, published last month, sets out a clear vision to capitalise on the enormous opportunities that a net zero energy system offers the industry, our economy and our climate. It highlights the importance of accelerating the transition to renewable energy sources. Uh, we have clearly and repeatedly set out the actions that the UK Government uh, should and must now take to ensure a fair and just transition for our energy sector and what will be a decisive decade for action. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? Despite the utterly obscene profits of the oil and gas companies, investment in transition is not happening at anything like the pace needed to keep 1.5 alive. Over the last week, I've met with both Shell and ExxonMobil, who operate the Moss Moran complex in Fife, the third largest climate polluter in Scotland. Does the First Minister agree that we cannot meet Scotland's climate targets without slashing Moss Moran's emissions? And will she call on both the operators and the UK Government to commit to investment in a just transition plan for the Moss Moran complex? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, let me reiterate uh, the Scottish Government's commitment to a just transition uh, that both meets our climate targets but also supports good <laughs> green jobs uh, for our highly skilled workforce um, and that allows industry to retain international competitiveness. 
Uh, Mark Ruskell is right to say that the decarbonisation of industry plays a vitally important role in achieving all of that, and operators, including those at Most Morin, uh, have much to gain from being at the forefront of a just transition, uh, and I would urge them to make sure that is exactly uh, where they are. Uh, we're currently developing a just transition plan uh, for Scotland's largest industrial site at Grangemouth, uh, and on completion of that, we will evaluate and consider what learnings can be replicated across other sites uh, like Most Morin. Uh, the draft energy strategy and just transition plan it makes clear, of course, that the UK Government must also take action across a number of areas, and we continue to urge them to commit to a concrete uh, timeline and processes uh, to ensure that that is the case. We move to general and constituency supplementaries. I call Jackie Bailey. The First Minister has been sent a letter from the STUC and Commonweal setting out their serious concerns about the National Care Service Bill, uh, asking that the bill is paused. They are joined by the GMB, Unison, Unite, the Scottish Pensioners Forum, Who Cares Scotland, Parkinson's UK, respected Professor of Public Policy, James Mitchell, the SNP trade union group and more besides. And this follows significant criticism of the bill by no less than four committees of this parliament, COSLA, a host of care providers and those receiving care themselves. There's nothing to stop the SNP from delivering improvements to social care now, like fair pay and ending non-residential care charges. But the sector is concerned that the SNP are not listening to their concerns and are intent on bulldozing this bill through. Will the First Minister pause the bill and take the time required to get it right? First Minister. Of course we will uh, take the, the time required to get it uh, right. Uh, there was a line in the letter that Jackie Bailey referred to that she didn't read out, of course, so I will. We want to emphasise that we share the Scottish Government's desire to create a national care service. There are several committees of this Parliament scrutinising the bill at stage one. Uh, when we uh, have all of the reports and all of the feedback, uh, we will take time to consider uh, all of the issues that have been raised. And of course, at that stage, we will set out uh, the timescale uh, for the rest of the legislative uh, process. And of course, in the interim, uh, we are taking steps to improve uh, social care. Yep. Uh, and let's remember what a national care service is about. It's about ending the postcode lottery in care provision, and it's about better rewarding those who work within the sector. In the year ahead, we're taking action to boost social care workers' uh, pay and, of course, getting the initial organisational arrangements in place. So we'll continue to proceed in that responsible way. Uh, and as we do so, we will listen to the views of all of the organisations uh, that are signatories to the letter, um, and I'm sure many others beside. Julian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister, along with the Minister for Public Health, convened a further summit on abortion services earlier this week, which was hugely useful in exploring further themes for my Members' Bill, and I'm very grateful for the Scottish Government's support. Could the First Minister update the Chamber on next steps and what she sees as the most important steps we can take to protect and further abortion rights in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I was uh, very pleased to convene with Marie Todd uh, the, the second uh, abortion summit uh, on Tuesday and thank uh, those members from across the parties here who attended uh, that. We had a very constructive discussion on the outcomes of the recent UK Supreme Court judgment on Northern Ireland's Safe Access Zones Bill and on the further issues we must consider for Scottish legislation. Uh, the discussion underlined the continuing need uh, for national legislation on this matter and let me reiterate the Government's commitment to that uh, and of course provided useful insights as the Government continues to work with Gillian Mackay to develop a bill that is robust and effective uh, and I know we want to see that introduced to the Scottish Parliament uh, as soon as possible. In addition, we were all clear uh, that the commitment to progressing abortion care and ensuring that women have access to high quality abortion care in Scotland uh, that are outlined in the Women's Health Plan are a priority and will be taken forward. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Uh, the BBC documentary Beneath the Magic Circle Affair cast light on a very dark and distressing subject. Senior members of Scotland's legal establishment sexually abused children for decades. Susie Henderson's childhood was destroyed at the hands of her untouchable QC father and his vile associates. Yet the government's child abuse inquiry will not hear evidence about this. Uh, other survivors, including young footballers, have called for the inquiry to broaden its scope. So I would like to ask Nicola Sturgeon if that will happen. First Minister. Firstly, the 
content of the BBC documentary uh, were extreme, was sorry, extremely uh, distressing and disturbing, and um, I think all of us uh, want to ensure um, that these matters, in the appropriate way, are properly investigated. Obviously, any uh, criminal investigations are for the, the Crown, and it would be deeply inappropriate for me or anybody else to comment on that. In terms of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, I absolutely hear uh, the points uh, that the member is making, but as uh, he is aware, under the Inquiries Act, uh, the remit uh, and the conduct of a public inquiry is entirely for the inquiry and for the chair uh, of the inquiry, and ministers cannot intervene in that. Uh, but it is really important uh, that all of the matters raised uh, in whatever uh, way is necessary uh, are properly scrutinised, uh, probed and investigated, and I think that is something all of us uh, want to ensure is the case. Paul McLennan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A new report from the National Institute for Economic and Social Research warns that households in my constituency and right across the UK could face a 4,000 financial crisis, uh, hit from the cost of living crisis this year. Can I ask the First Minister what can the Scottish Government do to urge the UK Government to reverse its plans to allow energy bills to rise again this spring, which will only heap more misery on those already suffering? First Minister. Well, Paul McLennan is right uh, to raise the impact on households in his constituency and across Scotland. We have consistently called on the UK Government to provide additional support for vulnerable households with their energy costs. Uh, prior to the introduction of the energy price guarantee last October, we called for the energy price cap to be frozen. Uh, and now uh, we need the UK Government to urgently uh, consider cancelling its proposed uh, rise, uh, along with the reduction in support for domestic uh, consumers. Uh, we continue we need to take action we can to support households, including, as I said earlier on, doubling of the fuel insecurity fund. Uh, but the key levers here uh, do lie with the UK Government, and we must press them to use those levers in the interests of households and businesses across the country. Andrew de Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has betrayed communities in the north of Scotland with her broken promise to duel the A9. It is clear that the work required to fulfil this promise has never been done. Her government seeks to blame events that should never have impacted on this timetable. So will she now give us a date for completion of the duelling of the A9, or is she really telling us that the Greens are running her government? First Minister. Well, firstly, let me, let me be very clear. The Scottish Government is firmly committed to completing the duelling of the A9 between Perth and Thank Inverness. Uh, that is a £3 billion investment. Uh, there has been already over £430 million invested in it. Road users are already benefiting from some stretches already duelled. Um, on the uh, issue covered in Parliament uh, yesterday, uh, we have carefully reviewed uh, the submitted tender for that stretch and concluded, uh, after a very difficult and complex procurement procedure, that award of that contract at this time would not represent best value for the taxpayer. The price of that tender was significantly higher than expected, even allowing for the impacts of inflation and a volatile economy. And had we gone ahead with that, then down the line, I am sure opposition members would have criticised us for doing so because it was not best value for the taxpayer. As the Transport Secretary uh, set out uh, yesterday, uh, steps will now be taken uh, by Transport Scotland on the necessary preparatory steps for the urgent retendering with the aim of achieving a contract award before the end of uh, this year and a new timetable will be set out as quickly as possible. Uh, it is also important to point out, finally, Presiding Officer, that design work is progressing on the rest of the programme with ministerial decisions to complete the statutory process confirmed for seven of the remaining eight schemes. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's debate in the name of Emma Roddick. And there will be a short suspension now to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so.